I'm very pleased to be joined by David Lerner, co-founder of TechServe, that's the Apple computer specialty retailer founded in 1987. And John David, president of the Acumen Group, a 15-year-old technology consulting firm which specializes in custom software solutions for corporations. Gentlemen, welcome to Citywide. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. John, is New York a high-tech town? Absolutely. Um, New York started uh, in its infancy in, uh, in technology back in the early 80s. I remember uh, connecting two computers together, and now I can sit in Bryan Park with my laptop and uh, surf the internet. You know, Google just opened a, a big uh, uh, store here, um, enterprise store, um, trying to recreate Silicon Valley here. But I think uh, Silicon Alley's been here for a long time, and it's here to stay. David, your business started almost at the low-tech end of the high-tech business, fixing computers that broke. Tell us a little bit about TechServe, its history, and where it is today. Well, my partners and I met at WBAI, which is uh, before NPR, Listeners Board Radio in New York. And then we went into electronic product design. We made the acoustic guides. We went to the Treasures of King Tut exhibit. We actually manufactured cassette machines in Manhattan uh, with several patents. And it got very hard to sell that sort of custom product design business. It was like 50% sales. And the Mac started overheating at that point. The original Mac had no fan. And Apple charged about $300 to replace what was called the analog board. And we figured we could do component level repairs for I think $135. And so that's, that's when, how we started. When you talk about uh, about it overheated, you're not talking about it taking off in the market. It had no <laughs> fans when it first started. It, it had no fan. After a year or two, the, the transformers and capacitors would literally burn up. <laughs> John, tell us a little bit about what your company does. Uh, my company does uh, custom software development. So for corporations that uh, want to bring uh, uh, large data pools onto the internet, we do a lot of legacy work. Uh, we've also been doing a lot of Sarbanes-Oxley work, uh, doing separation of uh, tasks and duties between old legacy uh, systems um, and new processes. Um, and, we, and since we also design databases, we've also gotten to designing networks and doing complete needs analysis for uh, corporations. Do you think that the penetration of the use of computers into the business community in New York has has maxed out? In other words, are there it, every every office today has has computers. I think so. Um, is the small business community is that a, a, a part of, of your your business model? Absolutely. I mean, Macs are very popular in graphics, design, audio, video, any of the creative fields, and a lot of those are small businesses. Right. And I think as as the small businesses start to use the technology that the larger corporations were using, uh, collaborative workflow, for instance, or or portals for their business, uh, allowing them to. Uh, more closely aligned with their with their clients and their vendors, um, that technology is being shifted down, um, and it's becoming more and more uh, deployable and less maintenance costs on the small business. So I see that there's a, a huge potential for growth of taking these higher end technologies and bringing them down into the medium and small business sectors. But it, is this trend good for New York City? I mean, it seems to me that one of the the threats that people are concerned about, particularly as as the internet internet made communications easier, was that that graphic artist uh, doesn't have to be sitting in the cast in the in the Flatiron District now. They could be sitting in in Hoboken or in uh, in Hong Kong. Um, and the same thing for the different parts of the supply chain. Ha as you've seen New York embrace the use of computers and communications technology, has that been good for the businesses that you that you serve? I think it's a it's a give and take depending on the the business model. I mean, I think some businesses are are largely affected by it and by the outsourcing. I mean, we've been affected by outsourcing as well, and how do you get involved with it? But at the same time, um, you also need more expertise on the business process itself. Um, so from our take, uh, we actually have more business analysts now than we had um, you know, five years ago, and we have less software developers on site than we had uh, five years ago. Um, for our clientele, I think it's a, uh, again, as, as more um, technology becomes more in place um, and, and these tools become more widely used, um, they're able to take on more business. So it's a matter of if the business can keep up with the technology and the, and the, the growth rate and productivity. David, you're, you're competing now with large chains that um, a few years ago might not have sold uh, Macintoshes. J&R uh, right. has, a, has a powerhouse brand. You're also competing with online retailers uh, uh, you know, in the internet. Do you have an internet presence and, and how do you 
How do you hold on to your customer base in, in the face of all of these other forces? We, we don't currently have an internet presence. We're, we'll get there eventually. It's, I don't know, I think we have to do it. I'm not clear how that's going to play out. Uh, but really, I mean, the way we hold on is service. I mean, we, we are here, we fix things now or tomorrow, and that's a very local, local sort of thing. And with our larger corporate accounts, again, we have inventory here. If you buy a computer from Apple, it usually ships directly from the factory in China to you, and it can take up to a week to get there. How about the, about so, the Apple stores themselves? Has that had an impact on your business? Oh, they're, I mean, they're huge competitors. Um, I'm sure they sell a million times more iPods than we do. Uh, but they're also a source of referrals. Right. They, they only work on anything like within the last two or three years. Anything older is kind of not really interesting to them. I have, uh, I've been in TechServe on a, on a Saturday uh, picking something up and seeing people um, uh, carrying their, their computers. Uh, now, I'm not just talking about right. laptops. They're, they're coming in, and you almost would think it's, it's their child or their, or their pet. They're, I, they're I think so of it like a vet's office, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and can you, have you had some experience where I mean, people are really that emotional when they drop their computers off? Oh, people are incredible. I mean, the data recovery is the, the most emotional area of what we do. What is that? It's people, their drives get corrupted or damaged, they drop it, they erase a file they need, and sometimes it's their dissertation. Um, and so there, I mean, people are in absolute panic. John, your customers are tend to be larger organizations. Um, are they emotional about what they buy? Uh, no, they're not so much emotional about what they buy. We try to make them a little bit more emotional um, and try to have a, you know, a larger picture of what of what they think they want to do today and try to plan out for what they want to do tomorrow. But uh, no, they're they're not very emotional uh, beasts. <laughs> <laughs> and and what about the the? It's almost a cliche now that um, every family, every computer user needs to have a 15 year old on retainer. Uh, I, I mean, it, in some ways. Um, it's as natural for a young person to use a computer as it was for us to grow up using a telephone, and I'm sure that for, for my grandmother, uh, that the thought of being able to pick up a phone and call anywhere in the world was probably pretty pretty remarkable. But how real is this perceived generation gap? Uh, uh, is it is it a fact of life? Is it is it something that um, is is overblown? Is it uh, folks our age? You know. Right. Um, do we relate to technology in the same way that uh, that our children do? I don't think so. I, I think you know, they, you know, my children brought up with the internet. They don't know a world before it. Um, there's an interesting article in uh, this week's New York Magazine about um, the twenty somethings and how their their lives are an open book and how they they use MySpace and really aren't concerned about privacy. So it's sort of almost the opposite of what. You know, we do in our business is, is to protect people and, and to have people secure and have their information secure. It seems today kids really don't want privacy and they're really extending themselves out to the internet and it's something that I don't understand. When our son graduated from college, he um, uh, w was living at home briefly and every night he would take his laptop over to a particular well-branded coffee house, um, and uh, we were concerned that he was being antisocial, staring at a screen by himself. Uh, so finally, uh, uh, his mother asked him about it one day, and it turned out that he was doing real-time video chats with his friends all over the world right. because this particular coffee house had broadband, and we didn't at that <laughs> point. And it was the most social thing that he right. was doing every day, not not the least social thing. Has, have have the have have your customers' relationships to their to their computers and 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 sort of um, the way they're integrated in life? Have you seen a change in that since you started TechSurf? Oh, totally. I mean, originally it was strictly a tool for a graphic designer, an audio producer, whatever, and now it's much more than that. I mean, people had their work on their computer or their their dissertation. Now they have their music, their photos. It's I mean, it's made the it's made it a collection of much more important stuff when they do have a problem. Right. They yeah, you, freak out. Right, yeah. It used so. to be, yeah, for us, used to, you know, everyone was isolated. You were, first you were isolated on your, on your PC terminal, then your network, and now that people aren't isolated, they come in with a whole bunch of information. People are constantly reading about technology, and they come to us, you know, asking questions about it, um, and so it's really opened up people's eyes, and, you know, and not just for technology, but for, you know, all information. It's sure. really great. I mean, we, something like Wikipedia, an open source encyclopedia, where you're relying on the integrity of thousands of people that you've never met and possibly never never could meet. Right. Um, it, but it's it's now even to the point where some of those articles are being cited in court opinions for 
at least basic definitions of uh, factual material. Wow, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> no, I just, I mean, because I, in the service business, we see people, you'll read on the internet about a certain computer is incredibly unreliable, they're failing in droves. Right. right. And we're seeing that's not the case. And it's, it's a self-selected group of people sometimes who are raising the issues. Right. It's the and loudest, you, the, you know, right. the, the you, people that are loudest get, you know. And you don't know what percentage of the whole that is. Right. Whether it's a tenth of one percent or whether it really is five or ten percent. Right. So. Is, the, is, the, is the focus now on software or hardware? In other words, the, the, are we likely to see a new platform emerge? You've got basically the Windows, whatever version of Windows it is, it's, it's, it's DOS mm -hmm. at right. the core of it. And then you've got the, the, the Apple operating system, you know, and I guess Linux is, a, is another software model. Google but is trying to make the internet the next platform, and I think that's the way it's going. So it won't matter what the hardware is, it'll just, everything will be. That, that only works if you really have great broadband everywhere. Right. If you don't, I think you still need the you the need box. a local computer. Right. And, now, it's, and I mean, I think that's been Apple's success is the, the integration of the hardware and the software is just exceptional. Absolutely, and yeah, Microsoft really can't compete because they have, you know, they're, they're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of vendors, and they have to get their so, their operating system to work on all these different platforms. So it's much more difficult for them. But what I see is in the um, in the corporate world, um, using technologies like Google, there's a there's a, a huge movement towards uh, software as a service or SaaS, um, which is if anyone's familiar with widgets on a on a Macintosh, these little applications. And inside corporations, they're making these little widgets that can expressly get data just for one particular task, so you don't have to write these huge interfaces. So the combination of XML technology and software as a service is really enabling corporations to um, get to their, you know, get their business process flows in a much faster way than they were before and being able to change much more quickly. So I see the Google model inside the corporations as, as really a great thing. We will continue our face-to-face -face conversation about technology in New York when Citywide continues right after this. Mrs. Johnson, good to see you again. This is Mike. You can trust him. He looks just like you. I'll be sucking up to you in order to make you sign the loan. So, here are your low monthly payments and interest rate as we promised. Here's where they triple. The rest of this is really just here so that we get your house when you can't pay us back. Such a lovely house. Predatory yes. lenders are never this easy to spot. Call us and protect yourself with the facts. Welcome back to Citywide. We're speaking about the technology business in New York with David Lerner, co-founder of TechServe, and John David, president of the Acumen Group. David, the the Silicon Alley, um, uh, Silicon Valley phenomena, the internet boom of the 90s, took uh, what had been a hobbyist and uh, uh, IT professional kind of a, a market and expanded it more widely. We've talked a little bit about that right. uh, before. Um, and then the market, um, uh, I guess from a stock point of view, kind of collapsed with a lot of companies falling out of favor, but at the same time, consumers and businesses embraced the technology and it became more integrated. But could you talk a little bit about sort of business trends that you've seen over the last few years and what it is that, that drives a surge of purchasing in this in the sector? Well, I think the biggest trends we've seen are in the audio and video production. It's just, it's skyrocketing, it is so much cheaper to, to do it on a Mac than a, an older and avid system or tape, and it's just, it's totally changed the so, workflow. So that's getting people to, to buy things. Well, but I'm talking, I'm talking actually in the professional production. Right, but, but, but so, it, in other words. But it's, oh, but it, they need hardware, but it's, you can do so much more with less. You can do more with less. So people upgrade their equipment because it's more efficient, and, and if they replace something, they, they're getting more powerful tools, but for less money. Right, but it's, I mean, we have a customer in demand that does cable TV, high def, Right. They are now, when live shows are going on, they're ingesting, they're already editing the show while it's still being recorded. And that's you could never do that before. John, so. what about the impact of Y2K? It seems to me that, that America, the world, or corporate America uh, at least, because I'm not sure how many home computers there were at that point, but that people spent a, a huge amount of money upgrading. Uh, because and, and, and going through hundreds of thousands of lines of code. 
and, yeah. and, and protecting did. businesses, uh, you know, businesses protecting themselves against other other businesses that might not have been as capable. Did that have a, a, a big impact on the volume of money that was being spent? Did, did IT budgets generally Absolutely. go up Absolutely, I mean, we, were, we were working massive overtime hours during that time frame. Um, the, the build up to it, you know, everyone was uh, apprehensive what was going to happen. Um, we probably spent a, a good eight months just concentrating with our clients on uh, Y2K. Um, and I remember getting a, a call on January 1st um, that uh, one of our systems had a, a small bug in it, and um, you know we were able to fix it in about five minutes, and, and that was that was our only blip. Um, but yeah, the, the amount of money that was spent on Y2K, I think, was large, but it pales into comparison with the money that's being spent right now on Sarbanes Oxley. I think it's it's been a huge drag on um, on medium and large businesses. That is a. Uh, a system of, of controls that the Congress imposed on publicly traded companies to make sure that their financial reports um, are more accurate. What does that have to do with technology? Um, in order for the, um, the, the board and the, the people responsible for the financial reports to sign off on the document that, that they're now Sarbanes-Oxley compliant, um, a whole bunch of rules have to go into place. And where it really fits in technology is the separation of duties. Um, not only in the in the business process. In other words, the person who um, creates a PO can't sign off on a PO. Obvious things like that. Purchase order. Purchase order. Um, but as, as far as what we're concerned, it's put many many layers in our software development cycle. Um, so before uh, you know, we might have a six or an eight week development cycle. By the time we write code and the code is released into production, um, now we have to. Uh, sign that off to an analyst who has to do uh, QA processing and no more code can be touched uh, from that point. That, that uh, business analyst then has to send the code to an outside agency. That outside agency tests it and then they put it into production so that the developer and the analyst actually can't put anything into the production of an organization. So therefore, in theory, uh, we can't put bad code out there that's going to affect the financials of a corporation. It sounds like it's full employment for, for consultants like you. Uh, well, that, that's why I mentioned before that the, the analyst role has become you know, much, much larger. You know, people were worried about the outsourcing of uh, development, but the, the analyst roles have, and the consulting roles have become much, much greater uh, in the city. And, and, and I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. Yeah, so so, so there's, there's an example of an of a outside regulatory force that has an impact on, on your business. David, in terms of doing business in New York, you're a, you're a, a good-sized business. You've got, what, uh, almost 200 employees. Right. So you're a substantial employer, but you're sort of on the ground. It's, it's retail. That, that's a, a contact sport in New York. What is, what's the business environment like for, for a business like yours in New York City? I, I think it's great. I mean, the, the pool of employees, the people who come to New York from all over the world, is just, I mean, astounding. And, it's, and the customers are amazing. In terms of actually doing business, I mean, rents are stratospheric. How about deliveries, like things like that? Uh, you Taxes? Know, it's, it's, not, it's not that big a problem. Well, sales tax is a huge issue. People still buy on the internet to, to avoid sales tax. You know, don't pay use tax. Um, that, that affects us dramatically. There's a lot of concern these days about privacy and the, the integrity of the internet, the, not just the, all the email scams and things like that, but people being able to, to hack into, into systems. What, a, what was that, David, with you, with, with, in terms of a, an individual, whether they're a professional who's working at home, an artist, or, or just somebody that's got a home computer, what are the, some of the things that they should be thinking about to protect their data and their ability to use it. And then, John, I'll ask you the same thing about sure. some of the bigger companies. Well, I mean, most of it, pe people don't protect their data. I mean, people wander around with their portable computers with everything on them. There are ways to encrypt your data that's built into the Mac OS. But it sounds so complicated. I recommend. But it's, I mean, just click a box, <laughs> turn on File Vault, <laughs> and everything's encrypted, but then you got to enter your password every time you turn on your computer. So I think most people won't bother. I think the, some of the, I mean, the scariest things are actually like phishing attacks and stuff, just when you respond to an email that you get right. that you shouldn't have responded to. And Wi-Fi, if I have Wi-Fi in my house, am I, am I worried about people hacking into my computer at home? Absolutely. Uh, so Absolutely. What do I, who do I turn to? Because it, when, I, when I take that machine out of the box, right, I, it, it may not even come with a manual anymore. Uh, it, it's, it, who's supposed to tell me about that? It's, you're, you're pretty much on your own. Um, I think, I mean, the Apple system is somewhat closed. You know, if you use an Apple wireless base station, it'll be incredibly simple to set a password. 
and to lock it down. And but at the, at the backup, there's we don't. And but backup is just. I mean, we we drive that so hard with our customers. The need to because people don't really understand what does that mean backup. Why sh why should I do that? And but how if, is it complicated? If, it's no. No, it's very simple. I think as the pain threshold's coming down with backup, more consumers are, get, are doing it. But right. but again, just like David had mentioned, you know, with locking down and turning File Vault on or in Vista in encrypting the, the drive and having to type your password, that's a pain threshold, even though how simple that people just don't seem to want to do. And corporations, it's forced on them, so they really don't have a choice. Um, but consumers, I think, definitely an issue. Yeah. Just this recently, there was an attack on the computer system that operates the the internet, and I, I don't think they've yet identified where that came from. But um, I'm I'm not sure that we would know what to do if the if it would you know if the if the internet <laughs> yeah, went went down. went down. And I don't think that companies are organized these days to be able to have that kind of redundancy. I mean, we'd be back relying on our cell phones if those even worked. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it costs a lot of money for a corporation. Remember, after uh, after 9/11, uh, a lot of corporations moved to d d disaster recovery sites, and those disaster recovery sites uh, rely on T1 data lines in order to get the data from, you know, their production environment to this offsite environment. So, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a critical issue that really hasn't been solved, and people really aren't, you know, in their plans aren't prepared to move their, their tape structure out, out out of sight if that tape structure is even viable at that point. So, what do you think the next big thing in tech is? Yikes. <laughs> I, I think it's more of the same. It's, I mean, video, it, it's just, you know, it's the home hi-fi, it's the whole... Smaller, better, the hub of The hub of your life, yeah, yeah. Getting content onto but, the TV. Right. I think as the internet gets faster, it's just me, more content's going to be coming over the internet, and the, the computer is going to be the hub. And sort of almost Star Trek in, all the data that you'll ever need in the palm of your hand when you want Available, it, yeah. always? Well. I think for for uh, for medium businesses again, it's it's bringing the uh, the more collaborative environments down. The the, the, the threshold points of having a uh, a portal with uh, products like SharePoint or eRoom, allowing people to uh, communicate and have uh, storyboards or having projects managed on the internet. I think those are the types of things that we're seeing for the next two three years of growth. Also, security is a big issue as well. Um, and security is moving at, in the uh, small business, uh, medium business to an appliance level. So instead of having to install security at all the computers, you install it at one central point and it monitors the... Uh, so it's more, more about how we're going to use technology and the internet rather than some remarkable uh, uh, change in it. It's not you know, something where to drop in a glass of water and knowledge is going to pour out. It's, it's I think it's just the ubiquity. The ubiquity, yeah. it's everywhere. My thanks to John David, president of the Acumen Group, a 15-year-old technology consulting company which specializes in custom software, and David Lerner, co-founder of TechServe, the Apple computer specialty retailer founded in 1987. I'm Ken Fisher. Thank you for joining us.